Remember, when the aristocracy catches cold, the peasants die of pneumonia. If such extreme measures have become necessary in the richest countries, what in God's name is going to happen in the poorer ones? When the shortages strike, the poor will inevitably and necessarily turn to less green resources. Many, even in Germany, are already stockpiling firewood and coal for the winter, leading to acute shortages. How is incentivizing people to cut down and burn trees and use coal in their fireplaces going to help reduce the dreaded atmospheric carbon load? The actual poor versus the hypothetical poor. Perhaps we'll be able to comfort ourselves here in the West with the thought that the food we take for granted will still be available at our tables. But wait, the crops that nourish our populations cannot be grown without fertilizer, loathed by green folk, and more specifically, without ammonia. And what, pray tell, is ammonia derived from? Could it be natural gas? And how many people are dependent for their daily bread on the industrial generation and consequent wide availability of ammonia? Only three or four billion. What happens to the continuous production plants responsible for making ammonia if the natural gas supplies are halted, even momentarily? They destroy themselves as they were not designed for such an unlikely event and they cannot be restarted. The World Bank itself has recently indicated that 222 million people are already experiencing the threat of starvation, described oh so nicely as food insecurity. The communists managed to kill 100 million in the last century with their utopian delusions. We've barely begun to implement the save the planet nightmare and we've already placed twice that number at risk. We are told an emergency confronts us, the climate crisis. The solution? The masses will have to tighten their belts to forestall an even worse future catastrophe. The elite academics, think tanks, and corporate consultants, and the politicians who subsidize their intellectual pretensions will not be particularly affected by such tightening, privileged as they are. But the actual poor? To such an elite, they must be sacrificed now to save tomorrow's hypothetical poor. And 222 million people is no doubt an underestimate. As the food insecurity gets more severe, more countries will place restrictions on food exports. That will harm the international supply lines we all depend on. Then, when the consequences of that manifest themselves, increasingly desperate politicians will begin to nationalize and centralize food distribution, as the French and Germans have already done on the energy front, and cut their farmers off at the knees, who will in turn stop growing food, not out of spite, but because of dire economic impossibility. Then we will have engendered the kind of feedback loop that can really spiral out of control. It will be poor people who die first, at least. But as we have all been taught by the malevolent eco-moralizers, the planet has too many people on it anyway. Think about this while you shiver all too soon in your cold, damp, and increasingly expensive and now substandard lodgings. You and your family may well have been deemed an expendable excess. Food for thought. This is simply not acceptable. If you dare to claim the moral high ground while serving the cause of starvation, then, by my reckoning, you've placed yourself firmly in the enemy camp and you richly deserve whatever is coming your way. In the psychological and educational arenas, too, we demoralize young people, feeding them a constant diet of concretized apocalypse, focusing particularly on tempering or even obliviating the laudable ambition of boys, hectoring them into believing that their virtue is nothing 
but the force that oppresses the innocent and despoils the virginal planet. And if that doesn't work, and it does, then there's always the castration awaiting the gender dysphoric. And you oppose such initiatives at substantial personal risk. But we can reassure ourselves with the fact that a beneficent government is going to set up warm spots in public libraries and museums this winter so that freezing, starving old people can huddle together to keep warm while their grandchildren cough up their lungs in their frigid, damp, and moldy flats. In such circumstances, in the face of such mandatory privations and manipulations, it's obvious that the last thing our tyrannical, idiot, panicked, virtue-signaling governments should be doing is directing their demented attention toward regulating what people serve at their tables. But because meat has also been deemed yet something else that is destroying the planet, the woke narcissists of compassion are already insisting that people eat less of it. Plants and bugs for you and your children, peasants. And the sooner you get accustomed to it, or else, the better. Let's turn our attention to the claim that animal husbandry and the meat it produces cheaply enough for everyone to afford is unsustainable. For a moment, because we haven't yet dispensed with enough moralizing and authoritarian stupidity. Remember what happened the last time that government agencies applied their tender mercy to determining what the people they serve should consume? We were offered the much vaunted food pyramid, telling us to eat six to 11 servings of grains and carbohydrates a day, with protein and fat at the pinnacle, something to be indulged in with comparative rarity, if indeed necessary at all. That all turned out to be wrong, and not just a little wrong, but so wrong that it might as well have been not just wrong, but a veritable anti-truth, something as wrong as it could possibly get. The food pyramid was brought into being not least by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, that is, by marketers, not scientists or nutritionists, with no shortage whatsoever of lobby efforts by those whose products ended up being promoted. 